everyone I'm hearing is talking about these smaller models collaborating together so they can be much better on the specific problem. To your point, I don't need to know how to make a pizza. I need to know how to get my sprint done to get the software out the door. But I can predict that the LLMs, the whole hype about them turning into AGI and solving all the problems, that's a pipe dream. Okay, and whoever talks like that, they really, really uh, haven't thought about the problem or they don't really have expertise. That. But, and ultimately, when it comes back to this collaboration and intelligence gathering, if you imagine your system organized hierarchically, just like our biology is, that each agent has its own intelligence, has its own information, and it can actually exp- transmit its experiences to the higher level, to the uh, to the liver and the liver to the brain. Okay, so they can communicate. Now you have cross uh, classification, information exchange, and inter- intelligence exchange. This is where it's worthy of research. This is the area that we need put, to put more money and research it like this in this path, but. I hope that we start paying attention to what matters and where we can really see an amazing level of ROI. Once we truly fuse AI in a a natural, organic way, in the way we're, at least we're suggesting in one way, with software that, that is eating the world in the words of Mark Andreessen. If software is truly eating the world, the real challenge isn't ChatGPT or AI agents. It's full AI software evolution. Masood Alabash, Omadea's CEO and co-founder, has three X's and deeply understands managing diverse tech products across multiple platforms. Now, they're solving the AI integration puzzle, and that's our focus in episode 63 of the AI Optimist, the Darwinian Leap, from basic to brilliant AI agents with lightning fast efficiency. My name is Declan Dunn, and I help entrepreneurs, small businesses, and creatives take advantage of AI before it takes advantage of them. And AI agents are at the core of this. Does that mean every business needs one big operating system to handle it all? That's old-fashioned software thinking. It's getting in the way of using AI effectively. This is an organic AI model Masood shares, and at the end, we'll find out his secret of where he found it you'd never guess. Let's dive into why most AI agents try old ways to solve problems and how Masood reverses it. The idea is so simple. Why aren't more people trying it? And a lot of people are like uh, noticing how the hype that comes with ChatGPT and the whole idea is creating cognition, which is sort of getting outed by a lot of people as a very nice PR thing. But the industry is so full of like dream And you're actually putting this not to some idea that it'll have cognition, but that it will be an agent that is autonomous, but is given rules and is audited. But let me bring it back to an interesting thing you challenge here. And it does bring us to the history of where we got here and some of the problems with AI, because so many people are starting with the technology of AI and trying to apply it to a software-based world that is form-based applications to object-centric design. And the critical entity in a business process becomes the intelligent object with its own communication channels and AI capabilities. You're moving away from form-based applications really challenges the tradition of user experience research. Are we throwing away the old way of doing it and starting to create a new user experience? Completely. I mean, but you put it beautifully. And I just see the AI, the prompt is a weakness is all I'm saying. I can do it. Not everybody can. It's a very paper form based idea. When I see everyone I'm talking with who creates apps, all move to something, I'll just call it a button, but the button is inherently an agent that does a specific task. Very simple, but it's all getting agentified as uh, one of my interviewees called it a MongoDB. Their, their mantra is, can we agentify this? And I really, and that's what I'm seeing too. What do you see? LLMs, the whole hype about them turning into AGI and solving all the problems, that's a pipe dream, okay? And whoever talks like that, they really, really uh, haven't thought about the problem or they don't really have expertise to that. But, and ultimately, when it comes back to this collaboration and intelligence gathering, if you imagine your system organized hierarchically, just like our biology is, that 
each agent has its own intelligence, has its own information, and it can actually ex- transmit its experiences to the higher level, to the uh, to the liver and the liver to the brain. So, and if you think of uh, electronic medical systems, all the x-rays can uh, bubble up their experiences of chest x-ray to the upper level and the upper level all the way up. And you can imagine that the information about the x-ray, the, if there's an intelligence up there and understands, it can communicate with the intelligence super object that's sitting on top of blood tests. Okay, so they can communicate. Right. Now you have cross uh, classification information exchange and intel- intelligent exchange. This is where it's worthy of research. This is the area that we need put, to put more money and research it like this in this path. Uh, I'm not saying the, 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 the trying to figure out how to uh, add reasoning and multi level uh, uh, the, the layers on top of LLMs and uh, making them safer. That's great. But I hope that we start paying attention to what matters and where we can really see a t- an amazing level of ROI. Once we truly fuse AI in a, in a natural, organic way, in the way we're, at least we're suggesting in one way, with software that, that is eating the world in the words of Mark Andreessen. Instead of one LLM to do everything, many chat GPTs designed for the objects driving business. The Darwinian leap is making objects intelligent, which brings lightning fast efficiency because the object coordinates it all and is super intelligent. First AI movers are looking at automating what people do, which is organizing and reporting an ancient practice. AI can do all of this if you move from helping people do what they're already doing and down to the actual objects that can take the load off of people and do it better. It's like each object has its own mini LLM, its own little chat GPT designed for its tasks and the people involved. Still, we have businesses with disconnected silos. It's a mess, all these departments. How do you stop these mini LLMs from turning things into more chaos? But your model will really create this. There's a lot of little micro LLMs. It's the complex web of interconnected objects. How do you prevent this from becoming an unmanageable tangled mess in large enterprises that are siloed and may not know, like the right arm doesn't know what the left arm's doing? Yeah, well, obviously you really need careful design planning for this, right? I mean, it's like the, ultimately what's wonderful about this is that you're not going to let LLMs run wild and make decisions on their own. What you're doing is really constraining each tiny little language model to the data entity that they're dealing with. Uh, Constraining information exchange with the right stakeholders is deeply embedded in this model. Imagine if each data element knows the type of stakeholders. If I'm I'm an x-ray, for example, and I know you're the doctor and I'm programmed ahead of time, knowing what kind of information I can share with you. Or I know I'm supposed to go read the HIPAA that was just published because I, I'm a system, I live in the United States, and HIPAA is basically a set of rules that is the healthcare privacy that the, the federal government passes, and they augment that from time to time. And let's say you're the x-ray, and you're supposed, you're my doctor, you're the x-ray, and, and I know that's my patient, and you're going to go talk to the patient. I know that I just go read that HIPAA uh, that was published two minutes ago, and I could come and tell you, Declan, before you talk to the patient, here's the latest thing that just happened. Not only I can constrain the exchange of and the type of information that people have access to based on their classification, this model very elegantly organizes this kind of information and it knows that these are segmented processes and does not allow breach of, of this. And this is all by design. It's not random that you turn a lemma and say, go figure it out. This is what the problem is with the large language models. That And also when they start, start hyping this about AGI, 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 that it's going to solve all kinds of problems. And, and remember, if I mentioned last time, it's like, I don't buy any of this hype. And it's great, all the things that uh, OpenAI is doing with the large language models, they, they do need a lot of improvement in, in many different ways, but they're not gonna be able to solve this software problem. The software problem is gonna be solved by rethinking building software from uh, first principle, 
with the view of the existence and the capabilities of AI and with some of these features. And the job of the software developer is not over. The designers and software engineers are going to have to come and have the, the, the basically embed their understanding, full understanding of these silos and how, how information needs to be shared with whom and, and what the rules are. So we are basically implementing and giving those rules to the data. And once you do that, if you could imagine everybody is self-behaving, it's basically self-disciplining or self-organizing and self-regulating, if you will. And on top of that, you can have engines that reason. So these are the next layers. Now, the common theme of AI people is, shouldn't we wait for AGI and AI to have cognition? Take a breath and understand how obvious this solution is when we get beyond the hype and mania. It's less complex and uses AI's power wisely while limiting computer resources searching through a universe of information to find specific answers for each object. The object just wants to know what's related to it. This is what makes it efficient. Now look at AI hype, waiting for AGI, predicting it, getting all excited when updates happen, which I love, but it's promising AI with cognition. There's no proof of that and making it smarter than humans. Okay, maybe that happens, but time and time again, we see holes in this logic and AI adoption really honestly is slow. What we're actually doing is making things more complex rather than easier. Here's why. Uh, I, I use a quote from Matt Lewin, who's just a futurist I've followed. And he talks about how our experience as humans, we don't, we so underestimate this in the hype of AI, which is what I love what you're doing. Because we have experience and we have a notion of ourself over time. How important is that per perspective that gives us imagination, causality, relationships, morals, ethics, goals, and intention, which is so key. And what you're doing with actually breaking them down into smaller models, I'm seeing others echo this, is that the whole idea of one model to be that brilliant is Fine. Now, people know well, what uh, these large language models so far are capable of, but they haven't been able to do anything with automation. Automation is software. Software is deterministic, right. and it basically incorporates the flow of information based on a workflow. But it, it, in order to I inject AI into software, if you will, we're going to have to rethink building software from first principle with the view of this AI. And the model that we're presenting is we think it's quite natural and very elegant and can solve problems from healthcare all the way to manufacturing. The software that we built using this tool is the first AI native software is a project management tool with the name of our company, Amadeus. And we're actually putting this out in a public beta pretty soon. We have a kind of a private beta going with it. We've got a couple of enterprise clients as well on, on top of it. We weren't really planning to go into the enterprise market in the first phase. but So we were looking at smaller groups, and that's where our focus is going to be. But we're using our own product to build our own product. So we're actually one of our own uh, the top users. You can think of it as a tool to create AI agents uh, without code that perform tasks and manage communication and documentation. So you could think of it that way in the language of AI agent today, but it uses that architecture of that I described that uh, we call object messaging and intelligent objects. So it, it uses that in the notion of a critical entity being self-contained and self-aware and having algorithms associated with it to limit its execution in terms of what all it can do. So it's not going to go haywire and, and, and hallucinate. It's a, it's a very deterministic process, but the tiny language model inside those objects just gives it the ability of understanding natural language, really, and being able to interact with users and understand if, if, it, if an object comes to you and there's been a conversation for two weeks with four other people and you forget about it, you just ask the object saying, summarize yourself. And I just summarize it and say, well, I like what Declan had to say about it. So instead of you going reading, you know, for three weeks of history, it, it right. can interact with you in an intelligent way. Or maybe you're an attorney and you get our system and you have four people working for you. And uh, 
you want to assign things to people. So instead of sending him a message, you create this task agent and say, Declan, do X, Y, Z for this client and it, it's belonging to this project, you know? So, and that object comes and tells you, and then you sit there and go, well, I need Susie's help as well. Uh, can you get Susie's help? And that object shows up in Susie's inbox. It's not that you have to send a message to Susie's inbox. So basically, this is really what changes everything. That's why in my introduction pitch, I said, instead of shuffling dumb messages back and forth, you're basically exchanging intelligent objects. And these objects just know where to go. Because if if you tell it, uh, tell ask Declan if we need something, it's like an intelligent agent. It's not a message. It'll show up and say, do we need? and it knows what to share with you. So this is really by design. And you basically, we're giving behavior, very predefined, disciplined behavior to these critical entities, these objects. And then we let them loose. But we will let them loose. They're not going to go all over the place. They're well programmed. They cannot execute more than these four or 18 functions, but they also can read and understand language and you can ask them questions. And so it completely changes the whole, the whole game. And imagine a lot of little bots that are intelligent, but they're confined. They're custom programmed, but they're intelligent. So they're, but they're not going to run wild, you see. New rules, new user experience. Can non-technical people use what Masood's outlining? By building intelligence into the object, it makes it easier for people to use. Now, designing for human usage is key here, and I want to know about non-technical staff. That's where I come to play. They might not understand the object-centric approach. Can normal people use this, or do we still need an engineer's training to get it? It sounds like the old question where people used to try to figure out how a computer works rather than using it as a tool. But remember, AI is a platform, not just a tool in Masood's world. No, no, totally. And it's funny, I actually, I'm not trying to get jargony, but it's like a focused language model. It's focused on specifics. It's not trying to be everything to everyone. Um, but what's interesting, when I go into AI programs, and these are very early days, so I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone, but that paper form metaphor, because it's what we know, it's persisted because it's quote unquote intuitive for users. That's an assumption I don't agree with because I go in, I sent a client to use this one tool and it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. I love Excel, he's lost. So the paper form actually blocks him from using the tool where other people have made the user experience a lot less paper form based. So how do you plan to make Omadeus's abstract, object-based system user-friendly for non-technical staff? Um, this is going to be the most user-friendly ever. And I actually uh, like your argument that they're not the forms are not as user-friendly. That's why you always need training on these systems. And right. the assumption is that if we're sitting and working in a manufacturing company and I fill out a form uh, and, and I'm your foreman and I say, you know, uh, you need to screw size of 2.4 and you need to turn this three times. And, you know, so I write on a form and you've seen that form a hundred times in, in before you're familiar with it. And we take that form and we stick it on the screen. Now that's the same form, but it just moves faster. It's not paper. And the user friendly aspect of it was that fidelity that you had on the screen with the physical paper. That's what that, that mm -hmm. user friendly, uh, illusion comes from that but you still need to be trained as to what that paper is and nowadays where we have these ad hoc ways of uh, creating forms that are not familiar to other people uh, they're, they're not at all user friendly the user friendliness of this system is that you can just walk up to it and start talking <laughs> so you can talk to the system and sometimes you can even click on it and it says here here's a list you can i could show it to you or you can click on it and i'll take you to that section of the of the program so the these systems are going to be a hybrid of graphical user interface but they're all going to have a human interface where you can just walk up to it and once you log in it knows who you are and knows what you have access to if i say show me a list of all my projects if there are 50 projects in there it'll just show me the two that i'm privy to see right so, because it knows me, it knows it will already authenticate me. Uh, and I can really start asking it questions where I could say, hey, uh, where do I find such and such thing? I can just have a natural dialogue with it and I don't need training. See, this is one thing that we discovered in, in the process of engineering this. Natural language is great. That's our advantage. But the computer has something that we don't have. 
the computer can generate beautiful images and show grids and color things in different ways, which is a lot faster and more organized than spelling things out. So the computer can not only talk back, but also offer you saying, here's a list. You want to see it in list form? Do you want, do you want to see the delayed ones colored? Here it is, or automatically colors mm -hmm. it for you. Now, these types of behavior are really up to the imagination of the new software engineers that are creating AI native software. Why the AI industry is taking the hard way first. Imagine if every part of your business has its own AI brain, turning data into AI super agents. Today, software users create records that bit shuffle, sending lifeless, laborious, dumb messages back and forth. So let's create AI agents to do the same thing. And hey, why aren't Microsoft, Amazon, and Google doing this? Are we all missing something? Wow, I mean, that just like that makes it so much different. I always think of the early days of Basecamp, which I loved, and Slack. But basically, these productivity tools became email tools with sort of an archive that was. And I'm, I liked them both, but they. I noticed that some people would use it via email, and some people would use it as an archive. And rarely was the person who did both. And this sort of puts it all together. Exactly. But what's really interesting is you're talking about deep AI integration of business applications allowing for AI presence at every point of the user interaction to be able to discuss it. Are companies like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, are they all approaching AI integration sort of incorrectly? Obviously, these are big companies, right? I mean, huge companies, and they're going after consumers. And not only they have to swim the hype, but they have to pump the hype. Right, because they're in consumer market, right, and uh, because you know that they they they're the masters of this game, but you're not gonna see innovative solutions that address the root of the problem because that's not their focus. Their uh, dream has always been how do we. Uh, basically kick Google off its uh, throne, uh, the search throne. Right. And they've tried it, tried it hard. And now they see themselves so close to achieving that uh, because it, before it wasn't possible. But now they see right. daylight. That's why they poured billion dollars into... So their focus is that. That's the focus. And yeah. I'm a tech entrepreneur and I, and I started uh, uh, technology companies and I always grappled with this problem. Why is it when I start things by myself, I've got 100% productivity, but as soon as I bring somebody else to the company, the second person, one-on-one -on -one is not two, one-on-one -on -one becomes 1 1.7. And then the third person, it's like, you just get the diminishing returns and you just got to live with this, right? And as a technology, I was really obsessed with solving this problem. And so we, since we dealt with this problem on a daily basis, uh, we discovered the or invented the, the solution. And then we, all the pieces came together. Uh, and this is how innovation happens, really, I think, most of the time, right? So, you know, you become the the animal of your environment and what you feed on, right? And it becomes, becomes your ideology and your outlook. No, totally. And, and obviously, like, it was really telling at the All-In Conference, not to keep quoting it, but Elon Musk, who was asked basically sort of the monetization question of AI. And I've never seen Musk, if you watch it, he literally is quiet for almost 10 seconds. It's almost an uncomfortable silence and such respect. And he didn't say anything. The one thing he did say that really struck, he goes, you got to understand, this thing can create software so much faster than like anything I've seen. I mean, you could hear the humility like, wow, like I can't even see it. And it's also funny because our normal bias, we come from a paper form world, software world. And but what's interesting with ChatGPT is it actually reminded me in the early days, because I go back that far when the personal computer was coming out, IBM had the idea that there'd be one centralized computer to rule the world, which is a total bias, right? We want power, we want moat. I'm okay with that, but this is actually like ChatGPT and all of them were trying to, but now everyone I'm hearing is talking about these smaller models collaborating together so they can be much better on the specific problem. To your point, I don't need to know how to make a pizza. I need to know how to get my sprint done to get the software yeah, out the door. Yeah, so I was challenged by a friend and I said, listen, uh, you should maybe argue with the ultimate architect. Look at how God created the world. Intelligence is embedded into everything. <laughs> 
it, and, okay. and we're seeing we're seeing yeah. the evolution. No, yeah. totally. We're always it's, it's, afraid. It's, you're living in a distributive intelligence, right? And 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 so you know, let's copy that. Nice. But, hey, so where can people sign up for the uh, to try this out and actually uh, to, work with you or give you feedback? Go to www.omadeus.com and just put your email down and we'll put you on the list. And we, we want to get as many people as uh, possible on this new exciting tool. And I think they're going to be uh, uh, amused and find a, a lot of productivity. If you're an individual or a small company, you'll be able to even run all uh, all your organization's uh, project management and communication and documentation all in one tool. And it's for free. So try it for free. Awesome. I'll have everybody check it out. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Declan.